Welcome back to our second session of today's Power of Us virtual conference. Now it's time we turn our focus to positive technology. How do we make technology work for us rather than us working for technology? Our questioning quartet on this topic are my former co-host from The Gadget Show, a journalist and tech expert who lives and breathes technology, Jason Bradbury. Hi, Jace. We also have digital anthropologist and best-selling author who focuses on the intersections between emerging technology, innovation, and digital culture. Rahaf Hafush. Morning, Rahaf. Alongside them, the man who expertly led previous thinker sessions on just these topics, freelance creative director and strategist Robert Dunsmore. Welcome back, Robert. And last but not least, Legal and General's Head of Group Digital Operations, Liz Harrison Flynn. Hi, Liz. So both Jason and Robert took part in a previous brainstorming event where the focus of discussion very much went in the direction of communications technology and the trials and tribulations of having the tech that we use on a daily basis uh, that has the power to do much good and much harm from the palms of our hands. It was concluded that tech must be inclusive and it was debated whether we need some kind of social contract with our technology so it doesn't move off in unintended directions to the detriment of the people using it. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. It was our tech episode of the podcast series that somewhat ironically had the most teething problems in setup connections with our contributors and equipment remotely. And tech can leave you scratching and sometimes bashing your head when it doesn't work quite as you want it to, which gives me flashbacks to our gadget show days. But on days like today, where we're able to virtually get together in times of national lockdown, it's wonderful. So how do we get the balance between good, the good and the bad sides of tech? How do we make sure it enriches our lives? It leads to more connection rather than less. And with apps and features designed to keep us online to monetize our interactions, how do we make sure we're only using it when it benefits us and we actually want to? I'm gonna turn now to Rahaf, because I think that's your area of expertise. Hi, good morning. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. I think the most important thing that we can do for technology is to start from the root, to start when we think about how we design the technology, how we create the business models. And that even begins by redefining what we think something that is innovative means. Like right now, we consider innovation to be any new technology that's just original or, or, or brand new. But really, we need to start looking at technology and insisting that new technology also be inclusive, transparent, sustainable, and ethical. And that those principles have to be built into the design of the technology, the business model of the technology, how the technology collects profits, how it markets itself, how it connects people. Because technologies are just the manifestation of belief systems. Technology is someone thinking that the future or that the world should be one way Way and putting in place tools to bring that vision of reality closer into being. So it's not only just the people that are creating the technology that have to do, that have to pay attention to all this stuff, but it's us as the users of technology that also have to be quite intentional with our attention and with our time and with where we're supporting and what technology we're supporting as well. So the short answer is it really begins with us and it really begins with the way that we're designing these systems and how we envision these systems integrating into society. Obviously, you're a gadget addict, but you have children as well. So how do you balance the time that you and they spend on, on technology to make sure it's benefiting you? I feel a sort of need for a catharsis uh, to admit that I, you know, have to a certain extent caused the, the uh, erosion of the social fabric of my own family. Because <laughs> when you and I were jetting around the world, and we really did, didn't we, Rachel? We really did do some we're all crazy, Birmingham. crazy stuff. <laughs> Okay, within, within the Midlands area. <laughs> and, you know, I remember you sitting on a jet-powered skateboard. I mean, we did bonkers things. We got world records where we projection mapped video games onto the side of a building. And, um, and so we're responsible. I, I certainly feel responsible for a, a real issue of kind of social disenfranchisement and, um, and, a, and a disconnect between digital natives and maybe what perhaps we'd call the analog generation that came before that's that's kind of my generation i guess i'm 50 so do the maths and i i do think it's a problem and i think i've resisted this i've resisted this um reality i, I but i've been so confronted by the transformation of my my little babies into teenagers um that I can't ignore the fact now that I think we, we do need to act. And I don't know what that means. And it, 
you know, the, the problem I have is being this sort of face of tech, as as you well know yourself, is it, it is it's it's tricky because I'm not pointing a, a sniper rifle at say the gaming industry. I'm not picking any any particular platform out uh, for criticism. What I am saying is that we need to talk about it. We need to have a dialogue about life work balance and what that really means. Absolutely, and and and, and when you with know, with, youngsters. of course, but not just youngsters. I mean, when we, we we say you know, working tech is working for everyone. I'll, I'll turn to you, Liz. Who who do we mean? Is tech inclusive mm. to everybody? We can't hear you, Liz. I'm afraid. We're just clearly having some technical issues, which is perfect. I think um, I'll, I'll I'll move on to I'll ask Robert the same question, and we'll see if we can get your microphone working. Um, okay. Robert, oh, there we are. Sorry, Liz, just you're just in there. Yeah. I think we can hear you now. Yeah. So do, do you Could think, you do you think, um, yeah, of I course, yeah, it is, is tech inclusive to everybody? Do, well, we, you know, we're talking about the, the, this question. Does it include everybody? Yeah. I, I, I think I, I would echo much of the uh, many of the comments that have just been made. I think um, creating uh, digital uh, capabilities, which is which is an area um, of expertise for myself, is I'm afraid we've lost your feed again. Oh, there we go. You're breaking design. up a little bit, Liz. Um, we we touched on design uh, earlier from a perspective of um, we're all very excited about our abilities to design online, but actually making uh, digital experience simple is complicated. And the other the other area to consider is the wide span of customers that we serve, both from very young and very um, um, enabled digital capability, right the way through our life cycle to our customers that are nearing and, and reaching retirement. So really thinking about those journeys is is super important to ensure that our users are able to understand the technology we're offering, understand the simplicity of the journey and the data and the content that we're deliver delivering and help them really um, make the right decisions from a, a, an interaction from a digital perspective. Um, I think this is a, a really important area. We focus a lot around our back-end technologies um, and uh, our move to our cloud solutions and the improvement Movements we're making from a cl uh, from a climate change and power efficiency, but our real focus is around ensuring we can communicate with all our customers in terms mm -hmm. of that that span of um, a base that we currently have. Yeah, and I think often stereotypically you might think of age as being a, a, a big factor in how you know comfortable people are with tech. And uh, Robert, if you think of a you know a, a tech designer, you're most likely to think of a, a young male, probably from an affluent country, which is going to influence the way they design the technology. So, how do we, we do we balance this so we can make you know less less confident people, possibly older people, less tech savvy, um, and people you know in, in in lesser affluent countries also able to use and take advantage full advantage of tech? It's about shifting the power to us. I mean, this is what this project is about. And so far, we've been fed technology like children are fed advertising at Christmas, um, whereas we have to redefine our relationship. I think we have touched on the transparency. We have to redefine the relationship that we have with the technology because we're living in this space where we're immersed in devices and services which are very opaque. So we have to shift that power to us so that we actually understand how they intersect with our life and how they 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 change the way that we're working and how they have an effect upon us because then we can be creative and we can actually make things that we actually want that's why we have to be more diverse and more inclusive and that was the, the purpose of this project mm -hmm. and Rahaf, do you think there's enough feedback between the users that the different the, the whole variety of, of users of technology and the designers to be able to make those changes to to make make it a better user experience. 
I mean, I think that's a really interesting question because I believe there is feedback, but there's two different types of feedback, right? There's the feedback that consumers say they want, and then there's the feedback with how they're actually using the tools. So it's one thing for consumers or for users to say, oh, well, I really want this, and I really hope the company does that, but then to continue to use the product as is. And I think that that raises the point where we, as, as the consumers, I mean, so often we put the pressure on the people that are building the tools and we ignore the fact that we have a lot of agency in this equation. We have a lot of intentionality. We have the capacity to choose where we put our attention and what companies we support and what tools we use and how we um, can demand the way that our data is being used. And I think people sometimes forget we talk about these big technology giants and these huge global companies, but all those companies depend on us. So as a consumer, I actually feel very empowered to be quite intentional with how I use these tools and where I spend my time and to be very, very aware of how my information is being used so that it allows me to engage with companies that have a vision of the future that is positive and inclusive and much more aligned with my own. Do you think there's enough uh, transparency in companies for to allow the users to be able to take control? Do they, do they know what's being done with their data? Do they know what's happening when they go online? No, I don't think so. I think it's not even what can be done with their what's happening with their data, but like what can be done with that data as well. I mean, there are some social media companies right now who track, you know, over a hundred different data points on you, you know, your friends, your usage, your search uh, behaviors, the different apps that you use, the different websites that you visit, your phone locations. And I just think some people don't put all those things together. They think, oh, well, what does it matter if they know that I visited this page? Or what does it matter if they know I purchased this product? And they don't understand that when you put all of those things together, we're creating these incredibly complex, quite accurate psychological profiles of people that can then be used to manipulate you know, their opinions and their behaviors and their stances based on the information that they're being fed by an algorithm that is generally protected by proprietary or IP technology terms, so we don't even really get a chance to see how the algorithm is choosing what to show you, or how the algorithm is choosing, you know, how it's going to manipulate you, or how advertisers are taking advantage of that information. Mm -hmm. I think if people saw that in a much clearer way, they would be far more at least aware of then how their digital footprints are impacting what they're seeing, mm -hmm. and how, most importantly, how the information is being chosen to be shown to them. Thank you. We're just, I'm just seeing now that we're running a poll, so please do answer. Uh, the, the question is, uh, has the experience of lockdown increased your confidence with technology? Because I know for, for some people, they're saying it, it's wonderful having everything online. Some people you know, who can't get out and about are now being able to take part in, in, in conferences, in, in meetings, and see shows that they wouldn't have actually been going to see. But obviously, there's a lot of you know, a lot of issues around mental health, the actual loss of connectivity with, 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 with real people and, uh, you know, people are spending more and more time on, on technology. And one thing I hear from, from, from my friends who are parents turning back to, to Jason is, is trying to get their kids off screens often. We're back to this. And especially when, you know, mentioning their, the, the, the use of your information, the, the, the targetedness uh, of adverts or, you know, we talked about infobesity earlier in the day. Um, I, I, I don't know what I'm going to do when my, my baby daughter gets to the you know, teenage level and wants to go on, it's incredible. on social it's a, media. It's a deluge. It's a deluge, Rachel. It'll blow your mind. I mean, I really mean this. I, do you, do you I think there's enough I'm regulation? Just... And do, 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 do you think that the, the well, regulators actually understand enough about these products um, to be able to I, I regulate don't think... them efficiently? I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how everyone else feels. I, I'm not a big fan of regulation. I, I think government's too big already, uh, and I think if, if one thing's come out of lockdown, it's actually, you know, the in enlargement of, of, of government's influence on all of our lives for obvious reasons. But governments aren't very historically v v very good at rolling that influence back, and that really concerns me. I wonder if we go back. Was it uh, Liz? Uh, oh no, I, I think actually, yeah. I, I forget who made the point. Uh, about uh, the fact that we that we have a lot of agency, and I think that was a really eloquent point to make. Um, I often say this. Um, I sort of stamp my feet and think. I, I used to say, actually, where are the young people? Where's punk? 
where's the, the the revolution but actually i have to say in 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 the last year or so actually there has been quite a lot of uh you know sort of um debate in young in in young people they've they've made their voices heard so i i, I think it's maybe unfair to put the blame at their door i think actually we're all guilty um of kind of you know like you eat too much at dinner and then you sit at christmas and you sit on the sofa for an hour in a kind of daze i think we've done that with data and that we need we need to wake up a little bit and take 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 control i think what you'll find rachel is that because <laughs> we you know we invest so much care and and love and attention and dreams and aspirations in our offspring it, it hits really hard and they're a kind of prism uh, that show us you know in, in you know it our own reflection so we're able to see how far we've gone down that data route where you're sitting with your partner in the bed and i'm sure people listening and maybe even the panel will know what i'm talking about and you're both on devices you know because the kids have gone to bed you're really tired now's the moment when i get to catch up on whatever it was that i couldn't do because i was doing a victorian doll's house or you know <laughs> Romeo and Juliet. These are all real things that have happened in the last week. I'm sure. Okay. I believe you. <laughs> so you know, and so you end up this. You you end up sort of in this socially isolated sort of situation. It's not of your doing. I wonder. I wonder if if I could maybe change the dynamic a little bit and just suggest one notion that this this device that I am glued to and that I I covet as much as I um, loathe. Um, is hilarious. If you look at it, it, it's so strange. The form factor, the design of this thing is so alien to us and, and how we interact with the world. Um, now, this might, this is going to put the cat among the pigeons, but, but augmented reality as a platform, as an aspirational technology, um, for me, could be a key to us clawing back a bit of humanity in a really ironic way. Um, I'm just going to leave that question floating in the... Uh, E ecosphere so aug augmented can... reality is going to save us it's going to get us off screens and it's going to have screens you know in our eyeballs <laughs> potentially <laughs> and it... that, that concept of, of technology any sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic you know that famous quote and i i wonder if we could regain the magic by getting rid of the obvious physical device but again i'm not naive to the fact that you know it could equally drag us into the matrix mm -hmm. so you know do you, do you think, because of, you know, po of, overall technology is fantastically positive and we, we all love it. We, you know, we use it, it improves our lives. You would hope, you know, overall there are much, much, you know, there are problems, of course. But uh, do you think tech is ever, you know, is it, it's inanimate, isn't it? So can it ever be bad by nature? Is it always designed with good intentions? And if something always designed with good intentions can go ast astray, leading in a, di a different direction, how do we, you know, prevent that how do we how do we step in early to make sure it doesn't go too far off in the wrong direction Robert well the tech is inanimate as you point out but to go back to what Jason just said that that sliver of of silicon he's got in his hand it started off with a human it's designed for a human it's designed for the reach of your fingers so it is a, a tremendously organic thing in the first place so the, the tech itself is okay and the tech is innovative and the tech is um, doing things to our life, which is amazing. What we're not looking at is the culture of how we use that tech. We're brilliant at infrastructure. We're fantastic at technology. We're great as individuals, but what we have not studied is the culture of how we intersect with that technology and so that we can get control and shape where it does something for us. And again, to go back to an earlier point, um, I lecture in university and the young people are so smart, they're brilliant, they're better than we ever were. We need to give them more opportunities. And if we give them access to this and they understand how this stuff works, it will improve because innovation comes from below. And I would have thought, you, you know, we, we talk a lot in this climate about diversity. Diversity is seen as a, as a great thing. So to get more diversity into the, the designers of tech, I mean, we, we, we've seen, for example, um, you know, face recognition software works better on Caucasian faces. Voice recognition software works better with male voices. You know, Apple, when it first released all its health app, didn't have a period tracker. Do you think it will improve to, 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 to get, you know, more diverse workforce and more diverse um, d design group from, you know, different backgrounds, different genders, etc.? Ask Liz first. 
Yeah, I think the um, <clears throat> the sophistication of design is ever improving. And one of the things we have to remember is putting our uh, user at the heart of anything that we're truly designing for. I think um, we can get very excited about new technology and uh, we have an innovation function within our organization, but you have to bring it back to the person that's going to be using this technology at the end of the day. And, um, you know, I, if, I, if I reflect on uh, the journey over the last five years for us in, in terms of where we started and where we are now, the utilization of what we would have perceived as modern technology five years ago is run-of-the-mill technology today, but critically our customers are using it and they're interacting with it and they're, fi they're finding it very simple. We have to push the, wind, the, 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 the envelope of opportunity, um, our exploration of voice and how voice interaction is going to work for us in the future. How does that link in to our breadth and aging population? And how is the technology that we have today, um, to everybody's point, the youth of today can embrace that so easily? How do we, how do we design capability that every age group can enact with? Rahav, I'll turn to you as well. Do you have anything to add on, you know, bringing di diversity and getting different people into tech? I know you worked on the Obama campaign on, on the social social media side, I believe. So mm -hmm. that must have been all about drawing in different groups of people that haven't been, you know, engaged in that area before. Yeah, well, much as Liz said, it's it's not it's also it's not just about including a, a people with different backgrounds who are then coming in and helping to program the tech. I think we need to also diversify the disciplines that intersect with technology. So we're not just dealing with, um, you know, a small group of programmers or a small group of people that are designing algorithms, but we're also dealing and intersecting more with the humanities, with psychologists and philosophers, with artists, with uh, people that can create technology that has that touch of empathy that what we call human centric tech. And so I, I believe that we need to make it less separate. And the more disciplines that touch the technologies that we use, the more people that say, hey, from a psychology perspective, from a historical perspective, from a neurology perspective, um, you know, this is what the impact of that technology is, then we're going to design just by virtue of including those perspectives, uh, more meaningful technologies that are going to have a positive impact. Because the technology that we use, every technology has such tremendous potential for good, right? It's just sometimes there are other priorities that get in the way, the business mm -hmm. models, keeping people glued to your screen a little bit more, but those can be mitigated and they can be navigated. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic, but I believe that the more diverse voices across disciplines and across backgrounds that we have, and the more that the human-centric experience is placed at the heart of strategies and operations and market analysis, then the better chance we have of creating technology that really improves people's lives. Yeah, I agree, and I think that's a common theme that's cropped up across this Power of Us series. It's, it's all about getting, uh, you know, new tech now. Gadget used to be an, a, a niche word. It used to be, you know, the, the kind of Jason Bradbury's, the geeks, Jason, we celebrate them, and now it's ubiquitous. <laughs> now everybody's got gadgets, and they're just in, in your palm, so we need everyone to be included in, in the design of them. Um, I, we do have some questions coming in. I'll, I'll, I'll put to you. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a great question. How do the panelists manage their own screen time? Anyone got any, any secrets for how to do it? <laughs> no one's got any secrets. Uh... Gonna... Yeah, go ahead, guys. I think I'm, my, uh, you know, the confessional has already been done for me, so I'll leave it to my <laughs> colleagues. I do, I do use the, um, the screen, the, the feature on the iPhone that limits how often or how, uh, yeah, how often you use each app. Uh, and I try to set limits and then I stick to them because I find, I don't know if anybody else finds this, that you lose like minutes. It's, it's, you, you don't realize how much a little minute on Instagram, a couple of minutes on TikTok, check your email, check Facebook. And then suddenly you get the report and you're like, how did I spend six hours <laughs> on TikTok or something? Yeah. And so I think being very aware and getting the feedback of how much time you're spending and how much time you want to spend being again intentional can help you get all the benefits without mm -hmm. losing time that would otherwise be better spent elsewhere and please don't take your devices in the bedroom leave them outside of the bedroom <laughs> give your brains what? a break you looking, so you're looking at me i'm pointing <laughs> i'm pointing at you 
I think probably <laughs> pointing at most of us, really. And there's, I've had an, a, another great, I mean, yeah, that's great. We, we need more transparency to, to see how much we're using our phones and then a bit of self-control, it sounds like, just good old fashioned self-control. Um, a, a fantastic question, I think. How do you feel about the level of power that the big tech, so Apple, Google, et cetera, wield in relation to society as a whole? I'll turn to, to Robert. How do you feel about big tech, the Silicon Six, for example? Well, that that power model is out of date now. We're trying to be more inclusive. We're trying to be more diverse and we need a much wider spectrum. We have to, to share that power with us because it's their tech, but it's our lives and we need power over our lives. Liz, do you have any opinion on the on, on big tech? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think um, we shouldn't underestimate the, the capabilities that those big tech companies have enabled us to do. And I think from data usage and you know personal intrusion, um, I think uh, we're moving into a, a better place. Um, I, I embrace uh, new technology. I think we, we as um, certainly from me, from a perspective of providing those capabilities to our end users, we have to be very mindful around, you know, GDPR related usage of data and ensuring we're, we're very transparent in terms of our, our comms to our customers. I think we, in roles like mine, we have a, a very important role to play, but I also am excited about future tech that's coming along, mm -hmm. so therefore want to embrace both. And I'll just finish off on a, on a slightly different note, because we, we focus on communications technology uh, so now, but you know, moving away from that, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of fear about the changes that's going to happen in the workplaces due to automation and and, and robots, and that you know the fourth industrial revolution. We're going to be talking about that over the course of, of these two mornings. Um, so, how do we do we make sure that these changes ultimately help people and improve society, Robert? That's a very tricky thing to do because at the moment we have very little control over what's occurring. What we really need to look at is what we want the tech to do. And so that's the unmet needs because we can do marvelous things. We can help people of different ages and different stages of their life. But we have to understand what society wants for those, those generations, what they want, and then we can fulfill those needs because we have the capability of doing it. Um, Rahaf? Do you have any, as a digital anthropologist, <laughs> what's your input? <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, I think it's it's a much more complicated issue. We need to not just look at the role that technology plays in uh, creating jobs or replacing jobs, but also the cultural impacts of how we as a society engage with work and our identity and how it's linked to work. Because I think that the technology um, that exists can be quite helpful, but you're going to run into psychological barriers when the definition of what a traditional career looks like, for example, or the types of jobs people have, that's going to change and that's going to look quite different from what we've seen over the last couple of decades. And so really dealing with the psychological piece about um, how does work fit into our lives, how closely is work related to our identity, to our sense of self-worth, and could we evolve our definition ever so slightly to consider different ways that technology can actually help make our lives quite easier. And, and, and Jason, I'll just, I'll just finish with you because we you know talking about that kind of automation and, and robots and you've dealt with the public, uh, you know, telling them about gadgets for, for, for your whole you know, career. Do you find that the, the public in general, do they trust technology? Yeah, I think that's what's happened. And I think to a certain extent that that trust is part of the issue. We talked, didn't we, Robert, about a kind of um, a, a citizen's um, agenda so, so that we took control back so that we were able to set boundaries or at least have conversations around them. This is coming from the guy who just half an hour ago said, I, I, I'm not sure about, <laughs> you know, putting on too, much, too many controls, but I do think the debate needs to happen. Um, and I, I tell you why, because, and I don't need to say it to, to people on the panel or you, Rachel, with your quantum mathematics degree, um, this is, this is we're, we're, we've passed the near the curve to use the kind of Moore's Lawsian language and this is exponential. We're, we're, we are heading really quickly towards, um, well, if you want to get really intellectual about it, the, the correct term is singularity. But what it really means, as you probably know, is a kind of uh, um, a complete change in our relationship with computers. So once we get to, to computers that are able to, for example, come up with new chemical compounds 
uh, in seconds, that obviously has a huge sort of existential reality for, for us. And we, we need to talk about where that leads, not just in terms of automation and, and jobs, but also um, who owns that IP. And because obviously, what, whoever gets that technology, if they use it in a military context, then you could have uh, extraordinarily effective new weapons. And that's not a great thing, is mm. it? So, um, but equally, I'm also a huge advocate of technology in case it's not obvious. And, you know, um, it's technology that's behind some of the remarkable innovations that we've seen around a vaccine in the last 12 months. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to preach a whole doom and gloom message, but we do need to wake up. And that kind of relates to your question. <clears throat> so in, in, in summary, keep enjoying technology, but keep an eye on it. Yeah, I think we need to, we, we, I think more than keep an eye on it, I think intervention is required in the same way that I am forced to intervene with my 13 year old over his <laughs> fortnight time. We need to all be the, the parents and guardians of the planet um, at this critical time time in our evolution and gain some level of control back before it gets frankly too late yeah. i think we can all agree with that well thank you very much the time has come up on this session but thank you very much for joining us jason rahaf robert and liz well, it's been a great morning of discussion so far. We have more to come with our final talk on sustainability, which I'm absolutely sure you don't want to miss. We're going to give you a few minutes break to make a cup of tea and we'll see you back at about 11.23ish uh, after the break. <laughs>